Welcome to Anchored by Truth, brought to you by Crystal Sea Books. In John 14.6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Our goal is to encourage everyone to grow in the Christian faith by anchoring themselves to the secure truth found in the inspired, inerrant, and infallible Word of God. God made every kind of bird. God looked at what he had done, and it was good. Then he gave the living creatures his blessing. He told the ocean creatures to increase, and the birds to increase everywhere on earth. Evening came, then morning. That was the fifth day. Genesis chapter 1 Verses 20 through 23, Contemporary English Version. Hello, I'm Victoria Kay. Welcome to Anchored by Truth, brought to you by Crystal Sea Books. We're very glad to be with you today. Today we're going to conclude the series we started several weeks ago on Anchored by Truth. We called this series, 10 Facts Every Christian Needs to Know. To help us close our series, in the studio today we have R.D. Fierro, author of Doors of Destiny and Prodigal's Advocate. Doors of Destiny is a great way to begin a discussion with family members and friends about their faith. And Prodigal's Advocate is for anyone who is serious about their faith and wants to develop Christian maturity. R.D. is also the founder of Crystal Sea Books. R.D., this 10 Facts Every Christian Needs to Know series has covered 13 episodes. That's the longest series we've ever done on Anchored by Truth. Why did we spend so much time on it? Well, before we get started, I would also like to welcome everyone who is joining us here today. And I'd also like to remind everybody that anyone who's missed a previous episode in this series, because we have had several, can find those episodes of Anchored by Truth on either their favorite podcast app or on our website, crystalcbooks.com. Now, the reason that we have been so diligent in working our way through these 10 facts that every Christian needs to know is very simple. There is a lot of disinformation and misinformation that circulates within our culture today, especially about the Bible and Christianity. You know, we are constantly being bombarded in our culture with narratives about abortion, about marriage, about politics, social concerns, financial concerns, etc. I mean, these narratives can be overwhelming. But most of the narratives that are jammed at us every day are what I call secondary narratives. We talk almost exclusively about secondary narratives but we hardly ever talk about the primary narratives that underscore all of these other narratives. Well, three of these primary narratives that we never talk about, hardly ever talk about, are deep time, evolution, and uniformitarianism. Deep time is the idea that the universe is 14 billion years old and the Earth is 4.5 billion years old. You have said that deep time is the root of the evolutionary weed, unquote. Evolution needs deep time because without it, the whole idea that the random collision of unintelligent atoms and molecules could have produced the biodiversity we see around us, let alone biologists that can study life, is ridiculous. Without deep time, evolution dies as a hypothesis even worthy of contemplation. Uniformitarianism is the idea that, quote, the present is the key to the past, unquote. In other words, Everything we see going on around us today is the same as what has been occurring during that deep time. Geological uniformitarianism explains why the surface of the earth looks the way it does. Biological uniformitarianism explains why living creatures look like they do. But in this series, we have pointed out that there are scientific observations that dispute deep time. These observations point out that the universe and earth are thousands of years old not millions or billions of years old. In doing so, these scientific observations are a death knell for the evolutionary and uniformitarian hypotheses. Well said. Most of our attention, as I said, gets focused on the secondary narratives. But we have to remind ourselves it's important to note 
that the secondary narratives emerge from and are dependent on the primary narratives. The primary narratives are the overarching paradigms that are so embedded in the culture that they're not even noticed anymore. As we have said earlier in this series, these primary narratives are like the framed art prints on your wall. Initially, when you put them up, you see them, you think about them, but then as time goes by, you just notice them less and less. And eventually, you only notice those art prints when a visitor comes in for the first time and makes a comment about them. Well, in our society, in our culture, deep time, evolution, and uniformitarianism, among other narratives, these are now primary narratives in our culture. And as a consequence, we've adopted the attitude that only fools and the mentally suspect would disagree with these narratives. What these primary narratives have done is to displace the need for God. Without the Big Bang slash Deep Time narrative, we would all look to God as the creator of the physical universe. Without evolution, we would all look to God as the creator of life. And without uniformitarianism, we would look to God as being necessary to sustain the operation of the created order. We wouldn't think creation was some kind of self-sustaining animatronic that just kept going because that's the way it's always been. So the net result of these primary narratives has been to displace the common sense notion that God is necessary to explain our universe, our world, and our existence. And of course, once these narratives do away with the need for God, they have also done away with trust in the Bible as being God's word. So in the first five facts that we discussed, we pointed out, and we really just scratched the surface, even though we've tried to be a little bit thorough, that the primary narratives that we have in our culture, all of them have major problems, but these problems are hardly ever noticed or acknowledged. In the next four facts, after the first five, we moved on to demonstrate that there is evidence not only in the physical creation, but also in human history, human language, and even in geography that confirms that the book of Genesis, the first book in the Bible, is reliable. And then the tenth fact that every Christian needs to know to ensure that they can be absolutely secure in their confidence in the Bible is this, that while the secular world has doubts about the historicity of the book of Genesis, the book of Genesis has never been disproven, and indeed it cannot be disproven. And conversely, while the Big Bang Theory in deep time, the evolutionary hypothesis, the uniformitarian hypothesis, that while these are widely accepted, they have never been proven to be true, and indeed, they cannot be proven to be true. And today you said you wanted to move on to another observation that you believe helps put the big picture into perspective. And you said you wanted to call this episode of Anchored by Truth, The Chicken Came First. That's a pretty strange title, isn't it? Well, I actually wanted to call this episode The Chicken Came First, Silly, but you objected to me using the word silly. Yes, I did. The title The Chicken Came First is pretty strange all by itself. Hmm, maybe. At any rate, the final observation I wanted to make as we conclude this series is something that my wife pointed out to me on a walk not too long ago. She pointed out that a lot of people don't understand the fact that when God made the physical creation and life, that God created everything in a mature state. And the uncertainty about that fact, the ambiguity about that fact, well, that's actually illustrated pretty well by the old question, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Now that question is supposed to be a sort of philosophical puzzle. You can't have a chicken without first having an egg. But of course, you can't have an egg without first having a chicken. But for people who are familiar with the Bible, it's not a puzzle at all. God created everything to be fully functional from the moment that he brought it into existence. So the answer to the question is really simple. The chicken came first. Or, speaking more specifically, the first chicken kind came first. But the Bible says that on day one, after God created the heavens and the earth, and the, quote, earth was formless and empty and darkness was over the surface of the deep, unquote, that doesn't sound like the earth was necessarily functional at that point. 
Well, it might be better to say that God initially formed the matter and energy that comprised the heavens and earth. Then he immediately began conforming the earth so that it would be fully functional to perform its intended purpose, which was to support the living creatures, including man, who would be the pinnacle of God's living creatures, that man would have a suitable habitat for him to begin his existence and population of the earth. You know, let's not forget that the moment that the Bible tells us that darkness was over the surface of the deep, that the Bible immediately goes on to tell us that, quote, the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters, close quote. So on that day one, God made light, and then he brought the day-night cycle into existence. And then on the next five days, God began bringing about further changes that would be necessary to make man's existence on earth possible. On day two, God created the waters on the surface of the earth and separated them from those that would make the atmosphere suitable as a protective and supportive covering. On day three, God made dry land and brought forth the first vegetation. On day four, he made the sun, moon, and stars to give definition to the cycles of time he was planning. Then on day five, God populated the sea and skies with living creatures. We heard about that part in our opening scripture. But I think I see what you're getting at. At each stage, when God finished that step in the creation process, the product of that step was ready to go. When God created the fish, they were ready to swim. When God created the birds, they were ready to fly. And both the fish and the birds already had plants available for nutrition, and a sun and a moon by which to know when it was time to move and when it was time to rest. That's what you mean when you say, the chicken came first. Exactly. And just to finish the thought, both the fish and the birds were immediately able to reproduce. They were created mature. Now remember, God told both the creatures in the sea and the creatures that were to inhabit the sky to begin increasing. And God pronounced the creatures that he had created good, which would mean they were fully functional and able to fulfill God's commands, one of which was the command to begin to reproduce. So this in turn answers another question that is a real problem for the evolutionary hypothesis, and that's the origin of biological sexes. What you're saying is that the evolutionary hypothesis has no real answer of how a gradual, mutational process can produce two different genders, both of which are necessary for the continuation of the species. After all, there are living species on Earth that reproduce asexually. Asexual reproduction is a mode of reproduction that involves the offspring being produced by a single parent rather than two. And the supposed evolutionary answer as to why there are a great many species on the earth that require two different but compatible genders for reproduction usually attempt to explain how the operation of sexual reproduction is beneficial to the species that are using it. But explaining the benefits of the operation of something is quite different from explaining the origin of it. The origin and maintenance of two different genders, the sex process, and the recombination of compatible components of separate cells, that is not easily explained, if it could be at all, by natural selection. Evolutionary biology simply hasn't discovered why animals would abandon asexual reproduction, or plants for that matter, in favor of a far more costly and inefficient process known as sexual reproduction. In sexual reproduction, not only must each gender possess its own unique physiology to make the process work, but those two different physiologies simply have to match each other. After all, if there is one thing that is certain, it is that malfunctions or mistakes in reproduction are pretty much guaranteed to eliminate a species. Thinking about what would have had to happen for gender to arise without design or planning pretty much boggles the mind. Random mutations would have to have produced two biologically compatible entities that were both formed at the right time and the right location. Those two entities would have to find each other just in time and know what to do. Then the cells from each would have to be able to combine in such a way that they could create an entity similar to their parents, but also possess a new ability. 
and if anything goes wrong along the way, the existence of the species either goes away, or at best, this newfound regenerative function disappears, and the earlier asexual process continues. As I said, the likelihood that all that occurs from random and mutational changes boggles the mind. Yes, and you're only talking about the level of what we might call gross morphology. Biological life doesn't begin with morphology and structural function. It starts at the biomolecular level. Living creatures are similar to computers in many ways. We, the computers, we don't just have hardware. We have software, the programming that's contained in our DNA. And of course, the hardware and software don't work if there's not a reliable source of energy that is available in just the right form and in just the right amount that allows all of the components to work together. And sexual reproduction is just one example of a biological system that must be complete at the point of origin or it's not any good to anybody or anything. Even Charles Darwin admitted in a letter to the American botanist Asia Gray in 1860 that, quote, the eye to this day gives me a cold shudder, unquote. Darwin knew that eyes don't function without a lot of moving parts, all of which must operate together. There has to be a clear outer coating that holds all the parts together but admits the light. There's a pupil that opens and closes to control the amount of light that enters and a lens that focuses the light. And there has to be a set of pretty finely tuned muscles and ligaments that will allow the eye to have motion within a socket that was specifically prepared to hold all the parts. There has to be a receptor pad to receive the photon and generate a chemical signal to be sent to the brain. But that signal doesn't do any good without an optic nerve to carry it and a part of the brain that has been configured to generate an image. And none of that does any good if the creature doesn't know what the images mean about its surroundings. When you think about it all, it's pretty amazing that anyone thinks that all those arose by chance. Yes. And again, you've only been speaking about the gross morphology. There are dozens of chemical changes taking place at the molecular level that permit all these various functions to occur. So when speculating about how eyes could have developed gradually, I've heard some evolutionists speculate, well, there might have been some light-sensitive spots that became dimples in the skin, and those dimples in the skin for that light-sensitive spot were gradually covered by a thin membrane, and that went over to become a primitive eye and so forth. But all of that misses the point. Even to have a so-called light-sensitive spot, that would have required dozens of biochemical mutations to have occurred simultaneously. And even the evolutionists will admit that half an eye or three quarters of an ear doesn't do a creature any good. Biological systems must function all together or they don't function at all. So, back to the chicken and the egg. The reason that it's not a problem for biblical creationism is because the Bible straightforwardly tells us that God completed a complete creature to start with. The fish in the sea were ready to survive in their environment. The birds were immediately capable of flight. They were immediately able to launch, land, maneuver in flight, and avoid trees. They were also able to lay eggs, and they had been programmed with DNA that told them what they needed to do to get those eggs to hatch. The first birds to hatch from eggs had to go through a maturation process, but their parents didn't. And that's why, in a very simple but powerful way, The biblical explanation is far superior to the evolutionary hypothesis. The Bible explains the puzzle of complete functionality that must be present for biological systems to work at all. And all evolution can ever provide, even it worked exactly as the evolutionists think it does, are pieces and parts that are somehow useless today, but one day they're going to turn into something like an eye or a circulatory system, or a flight feather, or the avian lung, for instance. One of the biggest challenges to the idea that dinosaurs turned into birds is that the breathing systems of dinosaurs are completely different from those of birds. Dinosaur lungs work like ours do. They are a sort of bellows where air goes in and out at the same opening and through a series of branching tubes that finally terminate in tiny air sacs. But the breathing system of birds is completely different. In birds, the major air passages break down into tiny tubes which permeate the lung tissue that are called parabronchi. 
these parabronchi eventually join up together again, so the air only flows in one direction through the bird's lungs. Birds are vertebrates because they have a spine, but their lungs are unique among the vertebrate world. It's hard to see how this system could have developed gradually because if an animal can't breathe, that animal is not going to survive for very long. And a respiratory system going through a change isn't going to work very well if it's only halfway through the change. Simply put, biological systems don't work unless they are complete. Now, that system may be relatively simple or relatively complex compared to another biological system, but biological systems are enormously complicated when compared to any non-living system. Eyes only work if the entire eye system is present and accompanied by an optical nerve and a brain. Hearts are no good without complicated networks of blood vessels to distribute the blood that's pumped by the heart. Birds don't fly unless they have the feathers that not only allow them to generate lift, but also the muscles to move the wings, the brain to make minute adjustments at a speed no human could manage, and lungs that keep the air flowing continuously. But evolution is supposed to work with no mind, with no intelligence, with no design. And the problem is that when pressed on how random mutation could produce such complicated creatures, evolutionists can only resort to speculation and guess. Here's how Dr. Colin Patterson, the senior paleontologist at the British Natural History Museum, described his realization that the evolutionary hypothesis was speculation, not settled science. Quote, I had a sudden realization. For over 20 years, I had thought I was working on evolution in some way. One morning, I woke up and something had happened in the night. And it struck me that I had been working on this stuff for 20 years and there was not one thing I knew about it. That's quite a shock to learn one can be misled for so long. So, for the last few weeks, I've tried putting a simple question to various people and groups of people. Can you tell me anything you know about evolution? Any one thing. Any one thing that is true. All I got was silence, unquote. So the chicken and the egg question points out something very significant. Eggs will turn into chickens when they are kept in the proper environment, but only because those eggs have been programmed to turn into chickens. And at each stage of the development, while that egg is turning into a chicken, the developing chicken is still fully functional at that stage of development. The system is changing, but it's still functioning at every step throughout the transformation. But evolution as a process, by its own rules, is never going to be allowed to know that a function is necessary for life. There's no way for evolution to generate the brilliant complexity that is present in all living creatures. Evolution holds to the core idea that it's random, undirected, purposeless atoms that are colliding chaotically and that somehow those produced protein machines that populate and power each cell. Well, all of those purposeless atoms just couldn't produce the protein machinery, much less organize those machines into a cooperative collective that is more sophisticated than a factory that builds passenger airplanes. So the chicken and the egg points out what Michael Denton once wrote, Evolution, a theory in crisis, the puzzle of perfection. Living systems must be complete to live at all. Living systems cannot operate with half-formed hearts or bits and pieces that may one day become a lung if that mutation survives another 500 generations. Christians are sometimes criticized as inserting, quote, God in gaps, unquote. The criticism is that when Christians cannot explain all the intricacies of a particular thing that happened, we insert God into the gap. But as we pointed out in our last episode, when the math for the Big Bang doesn't work out, secular physicists insert dark matter into the gap to explain the need for more gravitation. When evolutionary biologists can't explain how a permeable cell membrane enclosed a DNA molecule that just happened to be close by enough other protein machinery to make the first cell they say, quote, well, we just don't know how it happened, but we know evolution was responsible, unquote. So physicists and biologists insert dark matter, evolution, and deep time into their gap, and they tell us that is what science demands. 
You know, Charles Darwin speculated about his now famous, quote, warm little pond where life must have first emerged. Well, scientists have abandoned the warm little pond in favor of deep ocean vents or other exotic environments. Well, for Darwin and the others, warm ponds and deep ocean vents, they're like Star Trek replicators that magically convert energy and matter into living molecules that can then proceed on their own to craft ever more complicated and sophisticated living creatures. Warm little ponds are Star Trek replicators? Really? Yes. The idea that undirected, inanimate matter can produce the specified and irreducible complexity of living creatures is like believing that a chimpanzee can bang rocks together and produce a space shuttle. You know, there's a famous story of a woman who challenged an evolutionist who was giving a lecture on how evolution works. The woman asked how a single cell could ever turn into a human being. And the evolutionist's famous response was, well, you did it yourself, madam, in nine months. Well, the evolutionist thought that he was being clever. But actually, when he gave his answer, he eviscerated his own thesis. A fertilized human ovum grows into a human being because at the moment of fertilization, it contains the programming that tells that cell what to do. And furthermore, that developing human body must be protected within the mother's womb and supported by the mother's body until it is able to function on its own. The evolutionist was actually pointing out that life would be impossible if it were not designed, protected, and sustained until it can function independently. The chicken had to come first, and it did because there was an omniscient, omnipotent, purposeful God that sovereignly decided to make it. The point of this series and today's discussion is to help Christians begin to grapple with the narratives that circulate so widely today. As we said in the first episode in this series, Christianity is a faith of facts. But the truth won't do any Christian any good if they don't take the time to arm themselves with the facts and learn how to apply those facts to sort out the barrage of false claims that are directed against their faith. To close, since Veterans Day is right around the corner, let's listen to a prayer for those who have so selflessly given of themselves so we can continue to worship and live freely. A Prayer for Veterans Day Sovereign Father, you are a fortress of refuge and a shield of defense to your people. You are the source of certainty in uncertain times. Your faithfulness is everlasting and your pledge to protect your people is true. Lord, today we remember those who stood as shields in defense of this nation, a very great many of whom did so at the cost of their lives. We remember that the Bible tells us that there is no greater love than that a man laid down his life for his friends. Certainly that kind of love has been exhibited throughout many generations of soldiers, sailors, marines, and airmen. We praise you that you have sent so many brave men and women who have risked or given their lives so that others might live freely and worship you. We pray that you would comfort the families of those with loved ones in harm's way and special comfort for the families who have already paid the supreme price. We pray for our soldiers who have suffered wounds, especially those in need of healing now. You are a wonder-working God, and we remember and thank you that you are not limited in what you can do by man's knowledge or abilities. We cannot think of love, courage, and sacrifice without remembering Christ Jesus. Christ proclaimed that the greatest faith he saw while here was that of a soldier. It was a soldier who, in turn, proclaimed Christ to be the Son of God while yet on the cross. We share the centurion's faith in Jesus and pray and give glory in his name. Amen. Amen. We hope you'll be with us next time. And we hope you'll take some time to encourage some friends to tune in also, or listen to the podcast version of this show. If you'd like to hear more, try out crystalcbooks.com, where we're not perfect, but our boss is. is.